chapter 15, page 883, verses 1 to 10. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law mutter. These men welcome sinners and eat with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, be joyfully, he joyfully puts it, puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I'll tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she, does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my last coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. How do you feel when you lose something? Sometimes I lose stuff, and it's not that I lose stuff, but I forget where I put it, and, and I feel desperate. I remember when we had our firstborn, who's now 18, we went to the market. We had gone to see my in-laws. Uh, we spent a lot of time with my in-laws. Uh, my wife is an only child, so we everything's with the in-laws. I don't have any family around, so everything's with the in-laws. So we went and we dropped my daughter to the in-laws and went to um, Franklin, uh, no, to Jewel, if you remember that long time ago, Jewel. And we were at the parking and I was used to stopping the car and getting my daughter out of her seat. So I stopped the car and I looked back and I didn't see her. <laughs> and I said, I lost my daughter. And I can remember that was the, the worst feeling that I ever had as a parent, that I lost my daughter. Years later, I lost my son on JV Hi-Fi, <laughs> a high point. And I met my daughters, and my daughters and I were, we were looking for my son. He's nine next month. And I said to them, don't tell your mom, please, or she'll kill me. <laughs> Well, they kept, the, they kept the secret, and only like three months later, I told my wife, you know, we lost David once at JB Hi-Fi. We were like running like crazy for 10 minutes. When you lose something, something you can replace. If you lose your phone, you can replace it. If you, if you lose your, even your wallet, it may hurt. You may have to go back and get your license, and you get everything you need. But you can replace them. But you cannot replace people. And if you have lost loved ones, you know you cannot replace them. I lost all my grandparents, and we lost one of my wife's uh, grandparents, well, actually her grandma. And every, and we remember them every single festivity, every single party that we have, we remember them because we love them. We all have lost something. We all have lost someone. But sometimes we as a church if we as a people don't value what God values. And you've been around long enough to know that maybe as a church you have lost somebody. 
that you may cherish but does not come to church anymore. I have lost people who I love and they said, there is no God. When I got, I got baptized uh, uh, later on in life, I was, four, I was 14 or 13, and, and I remember that there was somebody else also who came to knowledge of the Lord, and, and they were saying, oh, we hope that there will be some Poles coming out of here. They were all young people. Some Peters, and I said jokingly, some Judas as well. Some of those who got baptized, when I got baptized, they're not walking in the Lord anymore. And I miss them because they were my friends. Does that happen to you as well? The question this morning is, are you willing to go to look for those who are lost. Not only those who don't know the Lord because they're easier to get back because you don't have a history with them, but with those whom you have a history with. Verse 15 and uh, verse 1 and 2 starts like this. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. Whom? Jesus. If you go, if you go back one verse to the previous chapter, and you will see what Jesus says. The last, the last thing that he says is, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So he's making a big invitation. Anybody who can hear me, come and hear. So Luke continues with the narrative and says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. Why? Because Jesus invited them. Jesus is the one who invites people to hear him. It's not us who define or who chooses who comes to hear Jesus here at the church. Jesus calls everybody the same way. And one thing that, that the church here in Australia and in the United States, in Western countries, is experiencing is that a lot of people who may not look like us, who may not, who may not talk like us, are coming into our churches. And that may be a challenge to you. And it's a challenge even to me. Because I have to learn how to relate to those people. The kingdom of God will be full of people who we may have never crossed my family is very diverse. Um, my, my brother married a, a girl from Fiji, who from eight months on, they moved to the, to the United States. She's, she's American, but she's from Fiji. She looks different from us. She speaks different from us. She likes curry. I hate curry. <laughs> I can't eat it. I get sick. Imagine coming to a church where, and I've been to those churches, where it smells like curry. And you have to sit there because you love your brother and sister. So the Pharisees got mad at Jesus because Jesus was getting along with people who they consider sinners. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, Mara, these men welcome sinners and it's with them. I told somebody here that when they took me out to eat and they saw that I was taking certain things out of my plate. <laughs> and they asked me, why do you take those things out of your plate? And I had to confess. If I eat, if I eat that, I'll get sick. Can I eat um, cebolla? Onion. onion. <laughs> yeah. I cannot eat onions. Yes. If I eat onion, I explode. <laughs> Literally, my insides, and I cannot move. 
but I also have Jewish heritage. So you put a piece of pork in front of me, it's very hard for me to eat it. Because <laughs> I'm not used to eat it. Eating is the most intimate thing that you can do with someone. When you want to win a woman's heart, what do you do? You take her out for dinner. And when a woman wants to win a man's heart, what, what does she do? She cooks for him. <laughs> Eating is a very intimate thing. And when we all be restored, when everything is restored in, in the next age, what happens? Are we go, what sort of party are we going to go? To the feasting of the Lamb. So at the end of days, we're going to be feasting with the Lord. So eating is a very central theme in the Bible when you want to know someone. And the Jews at this time, they didn't want to eat with anybody else. If one, there were three things that um, actually differentiate, differentiated Jews between them and the rest of the people. One was that they were monotheistic. They believed in only one God. The second one, that they were the elected people of God, that no one else was elected. Everybody was going to hell except for them. And the last thing was that they believed in, in an end of days. Though, those were the three things. But among the election part, the second part, they believed that they should not get along with other people. They should not work with unbelievers. They should not eat with unbelievers. They should not dress like unbelievers. That They should not even have their hair do like unbelievers. Jews at the time of Jesus, they didn't shave their beards. Why? Because in the Old Testament, it said that they should not be like the Egyptians. So they didn't shave their beards. I'm sorry. <laughs> you have a beard today, this morning. So they liked their beards. Women couldn't cook with certain things. Today, if you go to a Jew, if, if you invite a, um, a uh, very um, orthodox Jews, you know, those ones who wear the black clothing and, and they have the things and they always have in their jamaka or kippah, depends on what kind of Judaism you follow, you call it differently. If you invite them to your home, you have to be really specific what sort of things you cook. And on top of that, you have to be very specific what you have cooked before. Because if you cook pork in that pot, and if they find out, they can eat. Sorry, I can eat. You, put, you cook pork, there, uh, pork then, then I can eat. Some Jews take their own utensils, their fork and knives, because you don't know what, they, what others have used them with before. That's how strict they are. And you know, there's some people around this area that uh, they also don't eat with other people because they're sinners, because they're bad, because we want to, to differentiate from other people. I'll talk about that later on. But what does Jesus say? Jesus is calling them not to be so exclusive. And who are the sinners? Tax collectors. You know, tax collectors, as you have heard before, they were Jews. They are actually rich Jews who were taking away the money from fellow Jews. So imagine, the, just imagine that we will be a village, a Jewish village, first century Palestine. And suddenly somebody comes and knocks at your door. And you open your door and you see this well-known Jew with three soldiers. And, they, and then he asks, can you give me please your money? <laughs> I know what you have. I know how much land you have. I know how many lambs you have. I know how many goats you have. So you have to pay this amount of tax. And you have to pay it. And let me know here who loves to pay tax. Let me see the hands. We don't like letters from the ATO, don't we? <laughs> Unless if it's a payment. <laughs> so
So if we don't like it, they didn't like it. At least we don't have soldiers standing at, at our door asking for money. But these people were doing that. So tax collectors were hated. And who are the sinners? Sinners are anybody who doesn't follow the way that the Pharisees and the scribes said that we should follow the law. There was a belief in Judaism at the times of Jesus that if for only one day, if only one day the whole of Israel kept the law, the Messiah would come back. That's why you see Paul going after these Jews who believed that Jesus was the Messiah, trying to kill them because they, 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 in his mind, they were heretics. They were apostates. They were making the Messiah take longer to come back. That's why he was like that. So the Pharisees had set up a rule that you're not supposed to eat with certain people unless you defy yourselves. They had an inside and outside degree. And in first century Judaism, or in first century world, that's all that counts. Honor, honor. I always tell my kids that. You have to honor me. I'm your dad. Whatever you do, it goes back to me. If they, if they see you doing something, they'll say, oh, look, what bad parents. They didn't teach their kids well. And this sounds very old-fashioned, but still happens today. If somebody sees my son stealing something, what would they say? They'll say, oh, the parents are bad. That's why the Jews wanted to keep themselves holy, because they had a holy God. But observance of the law had become an end to, it, to itself. And Jesus wanted to change that. He wanted to change how people were so exclusive, and they wanted to bring people back into the fold. But in order to do that, he had to go the extra mile. He had to go a little bit beyond their comfort zone. He had to eat with the sinners. He had to eat with the tax collectors. The people that the, that the Pharisees had condemned to hell, Jesus was now eating with them, having communion with them, accepting them as who they were. It is easier to disassociate from such people than bringing them back to the fold. It's easier not to associate with those who have gone away from the church because maybe they have carried on with sin. It's easier to never talk to them back, never talk to them again, than to go out and tell them the gospel once more. Tell them that no matter how much sin you have done, Jesus is still have his arms open and the church has their arms open. The problem is that sometimes we make out Jesus as someone who, ha who is like this. He looks more like a mob boss than an all merciful man. And sometimes we make our church like the Pharisees. No, you should dress this way, or you should smell this way, or you should do your hair this way in order to be part of our church. Or you should live in a certain place. Or you should hang out with some certain people. Never do that mistake, my brothers and sisters. And then Jesus comes and gives them two examples. These are three parables in this, in this text. There are three parables. First, the parable of the, the last sheep. Then the parable of the last coin. And then the parable of the last son. So this is a sequence in this chapter. If you ever invite me again, then I'll finish it. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you about the, the first two. The last sheep. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you, who is he talking to? He's talking to the Pharisees and the scribes. Suppose if one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. You know that even though we read in the Bible that Israel, um, the, great, the great King David was a shepherd, 
uh, we read that God, we read in chapter 34, that he will be the shepherd. The Pharisees and the scribes considered shepherds as the lowest of the lowest. They didn't keep the law. Why? Because if you find a dead sheep, you have to touch it. And if you want to keep yourself clean and pure, you're not supposed to touch that, a dead animal or a dead person. They broke the law because they couldn't start the Sabbath on time. So there were many things that the shepherds did that the Pharisees and the scribes considered them unclean, unworthy. So what does Jesus do? He says, imagine yourself being a shepherd. Imagine yourself being one of those who you hate and despise. That's a big turnaround. I know that there are some um, um, rivalry, rivalries between countries. And I'm from El Salvador, and, and I usually make fun of somebody else. Let's say, imagine you being me, Salvadorian. And they said, no, no, I don't, wanna, I don't, really, I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> I don't want to go that low. So Jesus is using the same device. You guys, because he knows that he thinks that the, that the shepherds are the lowest of the lowest. Imagine yourself being one of them. That's a challenge. Challenging their, their points of views. There's, he's challenging their, how they view other people. Imagine that you are, one, you are a shepherd. And that you lose, you have 100, 100 sheep and you lose one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the last sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me! I have found my last sheep! I tell you that in that same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who, who repents than over a 99 righteous person who do not need to repent. Being a shepherd in first century Judea is not a nice business. You have to ward off wolves. You have to fight against sheep stealers. It's not a nice life. But you are in charge of a hundred sheep. And people believe that this is not actually a, a rich man's sheep, but this may be a village. You know, um, you know the whole village, they have 10, somebody else have 2, somebody else have 20. So he, this shepherd takes all of them out in the field to graze. <clears throat> but one of them goes astray. And what does he do? He runs after it. And the Judean countryside is not like here. Everything here is flat. Judean countryside is full of hills. It's dry sometimes. And you don't know what happened to the sheep. Oh, it's somebody else's sheep. Anyway, I can live. They, they can live without it. This shepherd knows his responsibility. So though, what does he do? He goes away and he looks after this only one sheep. And when he finds it, what does he do? He doesn't go, ah, you dumb sheep, like we always tell them. <laughs> you dumb sheep, boom, why do you go away? Why do you make me go through all this trouble? No, what does he do? He puts this, how many, how many kilos does a sheep uh, weigh? Does, any, can, does anybody know? Maybe 30 kilos? Huh? 60 kilos, imagine a 60 kilo sheep. So what, what does he do? He puts it on his shoulders. And then he has to walk back <laughs> with this sheep on his shoulder. I don't know how long. I don't know what sort of field he has to go through. I don't know how he has to go up or he has to go down. You just can't imagine the countryside. So he carries the sheep and when he gets home, 
What does he do? He, he doesn't say, oh, I'm tired. I'm going uh, to, I, I need to rest. Jesus doesn't say that. What does Jesus say? Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. Let's have a feast. Let's not kill the sheep, of course. <laughs> But rejoice, they have a feast. Why? Because I have found my lost sheep. And this is a small village. Jesus is talking about the countryside Israel. This is a small village. So everybody knows what happened. Everybody knows, hey, Lewis lost a sheep. Mm. There's a saying, I don't know if this is a saying in English, but a small town, big hell. A small town, big hell, meaning that in a small town, everybody knows what's going on. And this is a small village, maybe 50, 60 people. So if, one, if somebody doesn't come back with one sheep, they notice. And they start, oh, maybe, maybe he couldn't take care of them. Maybe he ate them up there in the, in the mountains. So everybody knew what happened. But when he comes back, he calls his friends and he rejoices. And we read about how in Ezekiel, the Lord tells people, the shepherds of Israel, how he tells them off because they haven't been taking care of the sheep. They let them go straight. They don't care about it. To the pastors, to the shepherds. How am I as a pastor? Do I let sheep go astray because they're giving me issues, because they're giving me trouble? Or do I go after them? There are some people who I will never win over. I'm not a gold coin that everybody will love me. But I'm called to do my best to keep anybody in the forward. You are to, call, uh, you are to do your best to keep people in this forward. Who's the best shepherd? God. God is the best shepherd. Whoa, if this person goes away, then let God bring him back. But didn't he use one of you to bring him in the first place? And look what happens when a sinner turns around. There's re more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner than 99 righteous persons. So if you keep the law, if you are a good person, praise God. God is happy with that. But when he sees somebody turns around from their sin, there's a party up in heaven. And the second example is this one. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins. Ooh, a woman. Now he's comparing them to a woman. One of the prayers that my dad taught me was, apart from Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Had, which is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, our Lord is one. The other prayer that my, taught, my dad taught me was, Thank you, Lord, because I'm not a Gentile, and thank you, Lord, because I'm not a woman. That's what Jews pray. When you see Jews praying at the wall, that's what they're praying. Thank you, Lord, because I'm not a Gentile. Thank you, Lord, because not, I'm not a woman. The male, the male ones, I don't know. I don't think the females would pray that. <laughs> but that's how this society is. So Jesus tells them, okay, imagine yourself being a shepherd. You don't like them? Okay. Now imagine yourself being a woman. He's having a go at them. Jesus is very confronting. Sometimes when they picture Jesus very lovingly, well, sorry, you haven't read the whole, the whole thing. You haven't read the whole gospel. So Jesus confronts them. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. You know that um, in archaeology, they have found a lot of coins in Palestine. Because what happened was that the men didn't carry the money. Oh, uh, this is a news flash for all the men. <laughs> First century Judaism in first century Palestine, men didn't carry the money. Who carried the money? A woman. They had either a purse or a or a or a pocket in the in in the um, in their dress, and that's where they carry the, the, the money. Just like me, 
every two weeks, I get paid, I get it out of the bank, and I dutifully take it over and give it to my wife. <laughs> because or else I'll buy books. That's what she says. <laughs> and it's true. So this is what happens. The women keep the money. Why do they keep money? Because this, again, this is talking about a village. In a village, what do people do? They have their goats, they, they have their goats, they have their sheep, they have their, um, their chickens, they have their own little garden, they grow food. And in, in, the, in the Greek, it says a drachma, which is a one day's wage. So women used to keep some money just in case the husband would get sick and he wouldn't be able to work, so at least we have a week's supply of food. So imagine if you are, if that's your whole savings, and if your husband gets sick, sick and you don't know when he's gonna get better, and if you lose one coin, you're gonna go hungry for one whole day. And these people were in 2.5 families, they were five, Eight children plus the mother and the father. So one coin was very important to these people. And like I said, in archaeological, uh, archaeological finding in Israel, you find coins all over the place in the house. Because, you know, in these times, they didn't have locks. Well, they did have locks, but they didn't have this type of window. Only rich people have these glass windows. Only you found them only in the city. So what did they do? Uh, have you seen those those um, those windows that, that the things something just falls over, but you can still get into it? So women, was, what they used to do, they used to put the coins somewhere on the wood of the house or somewhere on the floor, somewhere secret. How do we know this? Because of archaeology. They found coins all over the place of the house. So they used to keep hidden coins. But this woman lost one coin. And what did she do? She searched, she, she searched the whole house. She had a light and carefully found it. And carefully searched for it until she found it. And what does she do? Again, she throws a party. <laughs> she says, come and rejoice with me because I have lost this coin that I treasure. I have lost it and now I find it again. Come and rejoice. I have found my last coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing, rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Who likes to clean the floor? Who loves to do duties around the house? Who loves to clean the toilet? Who loves to cut the, to, to mow the lawn? Who loves to, um, to clean after dinner? Those are things that, yeah, we have to do them or else our house will look like a messy house. The same way we as a church have to do to bring new people into our church. We have to do a little messy work. We have to go a little, a little beyond our comfort zone. And just to give you a sneak preview, what does the father do when the, one of the, when the prodigal son comes back? What does he do? He throws away another feast. Because he's rejoicing of that his son comes back. Let us rejoice when a sinner comes back. But let us rejoice also when we go outside our comfort zone. When we go outside where we're used to and bring people who have been part of this church who have been part of our lives. And we want them back. Because God wants them back. I'm not talking about somebody who maybe went to another church. Well, praise God that they went to another church. They're still following Jesus. 
But somebody who has never, who has said, no, there is no God. It was just part of my youth or what, I was just going through these issues and then I went to church. Let us bring them back. And let us rejoice. Let's throw a party. Imagine coming, somebody coming back and he said, oh, you're back. And, and, and everybody, all the elders getting together. Next week, we're going to throw a party. Everybody's in body because this one who was lost has come back to the fold. Who wouldn't like to come back <laughs> if you threw a party? There's a lot of rejoicing in heaven when a sinner turns. This is the kingdom of God. Let us rejoice as well. Let's pray.